the life and times of a little enslaved girl brought from the Gambia, Africa to the Americas. She was bought by the wealthy Wheatley family. It was there she unleashed her geniusness. A slave ship has been on the high seas for two months now with a cargo of slaves from the Gambia, Africa. It has been sailing the Atlantic Ocean now. Death was aboard that ship. The smell of rotten flesh is in the air. Flies, rats, human waste, all echoes in the bowel of that slave ship. It is dark, cold. You can hear the moaning and cries, coughs, vomit. The near dead is tossed overboard. The defiant one tossed overboard. The sickly one tossed overboard. Providing fish food for the sharks. But despite it all, some survived. Among them, a sickly little girl. The year is 1761, July 14th, a hot day in Boston. A slave crooner named the Phyllis just docked at the Boston Harbor. Out comes the slaves, some shackled together at the feet, at the hand, at the neck, the slave auctioneer says, step right up, ladies and gentlemen, step right up. Feast your eyes, feast your eyes on the new slave just come in off the ship. Feast your eyes, ladies and gentlemen. Maybe you can see one that you would like to purchase today. All right, come on, come on. Take a closer look, ladies and gentlemen. They won't hurt you. They all shackle together. They, they can't hurt you. Come and take a closer look. Look at this one right here. He's got big muscles. Provide a good help around the house. Do a lot of work. Drive the wagon for you. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Open your mouth so they can see your teeth. What well, I can hear your bid, ladies and gentlemen. What's your bid? 100, 100, 150, 150, 155, 200, 200, 200, 255, 33, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, 3, all right, what's your bid, ladies and gentlemen? Turn around, turn around, come on, turn around. 50, 50, 50, 100, 100, 200, 200, 200, 200, 200, 200. Sold, 375. Oh, my goodness. Look at this little one right here. She don't look like she gonna last a week. I better sell her real quick before she just fall over right here. Up steps the wealthy Wheatley family. John and Susanna Wheatley. 
Oh, John, will you hold my umbrella? The sun is much too hot for me here, John. All right, whatever you say, Susanna. Oh, oh, let's take a closer look, John. We do want to purchase someone to play with. Oh, Nathaniel and Mary. And Mary does want to become a teacher. It will, she will be a good time to, for her to just teach someone how to do their alphabets and to write. It will be good practice for her. Oh, John, who shall we buy? Oh, John, look at that little one right there. Let's buy that little one right there, John. Let's ask the auctioneer. We'd like to purchase that little one right there. All right, let me see, let me see, let me see. I don't know whether this is a boy or a girl. Let's see, let's see. Oh, oh. Oh, oh, this is a little girl, all right. This is a girl. And let me see. Open your mouth. Open your mouth. Oh, oh. Got a couple teeth missing, so she can't be no more than maybe five or six. All right. Let me hear you, big one. One, one, fifty, one, fifty, 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 seventy, five, seventy. Oh, sold for one seventy-five to the Wheatley family. <laughs> I don't see anyone that looks like me. Where's my mommy and daddy? <laughs> Where am I? Where am I? <laughs> The weekly, of course, beckons her to come over to the wagon. They have to send the driver to go fetch her. <sighs> he looks like me. So the driver fetched her over and put her in the wagon. <sighs> All the way, the little girl is looking, wondering where is she? What is this place? Who are these people? And they drove until they got to the Wheatley's place. And when they got out, the Wheatley had a servant by the name of Mama Suki. And Mama Suki reminded the little girl of her grandmother. So when she saw Mama Suki, she ran to Mama Suki and she held on for dear life. Mama Suki said, Miss Wheatley, who this little person right here? They're grabbing me so tight, cutting off my circulation. Miss Wheatley, who this little who this little person right here? Is a boy or girl? I said, oh, she's a little girl. And I I purchased her today, so she's gonna be staying with us forever, like one of the family. <laughs> Miss Wheatley. <sighs> okay, little girl, little girl, come on now, come on, come on. Come on, little girl. Come on now. She held on for dear life again. All right, I know. Poor little thing trembling. It's a shame what that did to that little girl. That sheep treating us so bad. It's a shame before the good Lord, I tell you. All right, come on now. Come on. Come on now. Come on now. Oh, Miss Wheatley, I'm going to have to soak this little girl in two, three tubs of water. Burn all the clothes she got on. Come on now. All right, she's trembling. All right, come on now. Mama Suki gonna treat you real good. Let's take off all these old rags and put it in the fire and burn this thing up. Mm -hmm. All right, Mama Suki gonna throw that in there. All right, take off all your clothes. Come on now. Oh, poor little girl, poor little girl. Sweetly, she trembling. All right, come on now. Come on now. Get in the tub. Get in the tub. So you're going to wash you off real good. That's it. That's it. That's it. I'm going to wash you off, little girl. Mm-hmm. Don't worry, Miss Wheatley. I'm going to take good care of this little girl. <coughs> <coughs> ah, she coughing, too. I'm going to fix up some of my sassafras tea. 
She'd be good in no time. All right, little girl. All right, Mama Shook, you're going to wash your hair. Oh, Mama Shook, you're going to take good care of you, little girl. Mm-hmm. Oh, now. Now I can see your face real good. A pretty little thing, too. <coughs> all right, all right. Ah, much better. Miss Wheatley, we ain't got no clothes for this little girl. You're going to have to get some of Mary clothes. It's going to be real big, but it'll have to do till I can sew something up on my hand. All right, little girl. Come on now, let's put this dress on. All right, little girl, come on now. Put the dress on. Mm -hmm. That's it. Put the dress on. Huh? It's kind of big. But it'll have to do. All right, let's see. Well, now, got to put your apron on. No little girl be without an apron. Yep, no little girl be without an apron. Mm-hmm. All right. You got to put a hat on you, too, don't No little girl is seen without a hat on. Miss Wheatley, I don't know if she like it or wondering what it is. Hmm. Now you got to put some shoes on. All right. Go on over there and sit down in that chair. Okay, come on, come on. Come on and sit down in the chair. Sit down in the chair. Miss Wheatley, you know, I don't know if this little girl understands what we're talking about. I don't know if she speak English. Where you say she come from? They said she came from the Gambia, Africa. Oh, no. She don't understand a word we say. They don't speak English over there. They speak that African language, they say. So we're going to have to teach her to speak English, Miss Wheatley, because she ain't understanding nothing we say. Well, that's what Mary and Nathaniel will do. They will teach her English and teach her to read and write. Oh, that would be right nice, Miss Wheatley. And you know, Miss Wheatley, she can stay with me in my cabin. I got lots of room there. I'll make sure I take care of her and do her hair. And I'll make sure she can go out in the fields and pick beans and tomatoes. Oh, no, Mama Suki. This little girl will stay with us in the little room in the attic. And she will not lift a finger. She will only crochet embroidery and make tea and maybe a little dusting and that's all but she's not to do any hard work well whatever you say miss wheatley oh miss wheatley i think she like it i think she like it miss wheatley every day I would come outside and play in, in the trees and pick the flowers and just look around at the sun. I liked it outside. And I remember I got up early one morning and I remember my mother, she would take baskets of fruits and hold it up to the sun god. And then she would turn to the left and then to the right and hold it up to the sun god. Oh, Mama Suki happened to be looking outside. She says, Miss Wheatley, come quick, come quick. Look, look what that little girl's doing. She's doing some kind of witchcraft. Pretty soon we'll all have feathers and we'll be like a bird. We'll just pick up and fly to the sky. Oh, Mama Suki, just let her be. She's been a little girl. We don't know what she's gone through, what she's seen her mom or grandmother do. So we got to have patience with her. Miss Wheatley, what are we going to name this little girl? She ain't got no name. Oh, that's right. Hmm. She does like to play out in the green grass and the green trees. And the Greek word for green is Phyllis. And she was brought over on that dreadful slave ship Call the Phyllis. 
It's only natural that we name her Phyllis. And of course, she'll take our last name, Wheatley. So from now on, we'll call her Phyllis Wheatley. Well, whatever you say, whatever you say, Miss Wheatley. I was all right with Mary or Jane or Martha, but if you want to call her Phyllis, that's fine with me. So I stayed in the little room in the attic and I would just look around and Mary and Nathaniel would teach me the alphabets A and B and C and I learned the alphabets and I learned sky and table and chair, ground, spoon, plate. I learned everything and within months I knew my alphabets and I could write words and I could speak the language. And I loved to read and write and Mary and Nathaniel noticed it too, so they would take me to the library and I would get all the books and I would just read and read. At night in my little room, I would turn up the kerosene lamp and I would read until the lamp go way down. Then I would go to sleep with words on my mind. And sometimes I would take the coals from the fireplace and write on the wall. And Miss Wheatley said, Phyllis, you are writing. Well, don't write on the wall. I'm going to give you your own quill and ink. And I'm going to give you a whole stack of papers so that you can write whenever you want to write for as long as you want to write at night. Oh, when she gave me the paper, I would just write word after word. The words just seemed to come so naturally to me. So I began to read the Bible. I read the Bible forwards and backwards. And I, I would read the Bible and interpret what the Bible meant. And I would write it down. I started getting books on astronomy and geography and history and British literature. I love the way they, they put their words and they rhyme some of the words and the words describe things. So I studied the works of Pope and Virgil Homer, Ovid, Terence, Milton. I studied all the British literature writers and I started to write poems and I patterned my poems after them. I would start to write. <coughs> you must forgive me. I have the breathing sickness and sometimes I can barely breathe and sometimes I can barely write or stand for a long period of time. I have to sit. <coughs> and Amasuki made me some sassafras tea and it seems to be doing okay sometimes, but not all the time. So I continue to write. I continue going to church with the Wheatley family. I find something rather strange. The Wheatley family would all sit down front, but all the servants and myself would sit up in the balcony at church. Then Mrs. Wheatfield had me baptized, but she waited until everyone left church and then she had me baptized. I wondered about that for a long time. I wondered why she would do that. I would eat with the family and we would talk about what I was writing and what book I was reading. But when company came, Mrs. Wheatley had me to sit at a little table on the side. I wondered about that too. Why would she do that? And all the servants would look at me very strange because I'm in the house all day and I'm not in the field working with them. They would look at me very, very strange. So I often wondered about that. When we went to church, Reverend Whitefield would talk about heaven and hell and dying. And I wondered what happened to someone when they die. So I would often go home and write about that. I have to be inspired when I write. When someone got married, I would write about that. When someone died, I would write about that. When someone had a baby, I would write about that also. So. I wrote about a lot of things that happened around me. 
Mm. But then Reverend Whitefield died. Oh, I was so sad. So I wrote a poem about him. On the death of Reverend George Whitefield, 1770. Hail, happy saint, on thy immortal throne, possessed of glory, life, and bliss unknown. Behold the prophet in his towering flight. He leaves the earth for heaven's unmeasured height. There, Reverend Whitefield, wings with rigid course his way and sails in Zion through vast seas of day. Thy prayers, great game, and thine incessant cries have pierced the bosom of thy native sky. Hail, Reverend Whitefield, thy wings of glory. A lot of times, I would be so ill when the Wheatless went on vacation to Newport, they would take me with them. They said that the ocean air would do me good. So I would often go with them to Newport. And sometimes I would take my shoes off and walk on the beach. But this one particular time I went there, off in the distance, I saw someone about my size and it looked like me. And we just started running toward each other. Oh, and when we got to one another, we just embraced. I didn't know her and she didn't know me. She said her name was Oba. And I told her my name was Phyllis. And we both came over on that dreadful slave ship. And we sat down, we talked. Oba could read and write just like me, and we vowed to be best friends forever, and that we would write one another and tell one another what was going on. Oh, I found a friend. Oba became my best and one and only friend. Oh, that was a happy day that I met Oba. Oh, so we would go back to Boston, and I would continue to write. And I showed Mrs. Wheatley, the poem that I wrote about Reverend Whitefield. And she said, Phyllis, oh, you wrote this poem. It's absolutely beautiful. I must have it published in the local papers. So she published it in the local papers. And oh, she would get letters. And people would come by the house and said, Mrs. Wheatfield, I'm sorry, Mrs. Wheatley, oh, Thank you for writing such a lovely poem. But she says, I didn't write this poem. My servant Phyllis wrote it. And she would say, Phyllis, come out, come out. And when I would come out, they would, they would be taken back. They would say, she wrote that poem? Yes. And she didn't not only write that one, she has a lot more, a dozen or more. Someday I'm hoping to get them published for her. But, oh. People would just write letters and come by the house and say, what a beautiful poem. So Mrs. Weaver says, Phyllis, you know what? With all the poems you have, let's try to get them bound and published. But we're going to need some backers. We're going to need people to furnish us with money, some supporters. But all Mrs. Weekly tried, she couldn't get enough backers to get the poems bound since they found out that I wrote that poem. So Mrs. Reedy says, oh, what are we to do? Hmm, you know what? Reverend Whitefield was from London, England, and he knew the Countess of Huntington. I'll write to her. So Mrs. Reedy wrote to the Countess of Huntington and told them about my book. And she says, I'll be delighted to 
publish Phyllis's book. So that was a good thing. So Mrs. Wheaton says, you know what, Phyllis? In about three months time, John is gonna go over to England to check on some family business and also to do some business. You can go along with him, meet the Countess, and then of course, perhaps read some of your poems to the people there. And of course I said, that would be wonderful. But she said, in the meantime, we've got to have some backings. And we got to make sure that we had enough sponsors to back your book and also to write in the front of your book that it's okay and that you did indeed write these books. I know what I'll do. I'll invite the who's who in Boston and I'll have them come in one week's time and you'll write something right there on the spot, Phyllis. And then everybody will know that you indeed wrote those beautiful poems. Ah, the Honorable Thomas Hubbard, Governor. The Honorable John Irving. The Honorable James Pitts. The Honorable Harrison Gray. The Honorable James Baldwin. John Hancock, Esquire. John Hancock. He later on, he later on, went to Philadelphia and signed a very important document, the Declaration of Independence. He was there. He's going to be coming to witness my writing. Joseph Green, Esquire. Richard Carey, Esquire. The Reverend Charles Chauncey, D.D. The Reverend Matthew Biles, D.D. The Reverend Ed Pemberton, D.D. The Reverend Andrew Elliott, D.D. The Reverend Samuel Cooper, D.D. The Reverend Samuel Mather. The Reverend and Mr. John Mohead. And of course, Mr. John Wheatley, they would all come in two weeks to witness me writing. The day the men came, Miss Wheatley said, Phyllis, come on in, come on, meet the gentleman, come out. I came out and says, how do you do, sir? They said, oh, we're fine, we're fine. All right, all right, have a seat. I sat down at my desk. All right, hurry up, hurry up. We don't have all day. Let's, let's, let's write. Go on, Phyllis. For God's sake, write something, Phyllis. <coughs> what shall I write? Ah, oh, just write any old thing. Ah, oh, just write something. Oh, wait a minute. We hear that you can read the Bible. I said, yes. Well, what are the full gospel? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mrs. Wheaton said, Phyllis is not here for a Bible quiz. Stop asking her question. Well, we just wanted to make sure. Oh, we also know that um, she can translate the Bible into Latin. Say something in Latin for us. Um, what do you want me to say? I'll just say anything. Magister der dat librum disciplio. Um, <clears throat> what did you say? I said, Magister dat librum disciplio. <clears throat> okay, um, well, um, <clears throat> it means the teacher will give the students books. Oh, y'all, yeah, we, we knew what it meant. We, we, <clears throat> we just wanted to make sure uh, that uh, you knew exactly what you were saying. Uh, <clears throat> all right, go on and write something. Phyllis, for God's sake, write something, Phyllis, write something. Okay. Now we knew this was a sham. Mrs. Wheatley, you wrote those poems and you claim that your servant wrote it the entire time. No, I didn't. Phyllis wrote the poem. Well, write something, little girl. Wait, wait, wait. Let's make sure. They came up and examined the paper. Make sure there's nothing on the paper. All right. write about imagination. Imagination, who can sing thy force? Or who describe the swiftness of thy course? Soaring through the air to find the bright aboard, thy imperial palace of the thundering God. 
we on the pinus can suppress the wind and leave the rolling land behind. The universe from the star to star, thy mental optics robe, measure the skies and stop, 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 stop. But I'm not done. There's still a lot more. I'm not done. The words are coming. No, stop, stop, stop. You've heard enough. You've heard enough. And frankly, you don't <clears throat> know what she's saying. Um, <clears throat> all right, we've, we've heard enough. <coughs> all right. We'll sign and witness that Phyllis Sweetly indeed wrote those poems, and you can put our names in the front of her books as a witness. So all of the men signed. All of the men signed and they left. Mrs. Wheatley says, oh, Phyllis, thank you so much, Phyllis. Thank you. <coughs> oh, before we sailed off, of course, Mary said, Phyllis, oh, when you go to London, England, I've got to teach you a couple of things. They're going to be dancing and you're going to be invited to a lot of dances and palace balls. So you'll have to learn to dance. So she said, step up. One, two, up. One, two, back. One, two, up. One, two, back. One, two, up. One, two, back. And put your hand in the other person's hand, like I'm doing. And put your hand in the other hand. One, two, up, one, two, back, one, two, up, one, two, back. And then we started drinking tea, and Mary says, make sure that your pinky is up when you drink the tea. I says, why should I put my pinky up? She said, I don't know. That's what all the society folks do when they drink tea. And you don't drink tea, Phyllis. You would sip it, but very, very quiet. Sip, pinky up. She said, and one more thing. You've got a curtsy. <coughs> oh, please forgive me, Mary. She said, when you meet the Countess of Huntington, and when you meet the Queen and the Lord Baltimore, and Lord Byron, You've got to put your hand on your dress. Midway, put your right foot behind the left and curtsy. So hold your skirt or dress to the side. Put your right foot behind the left and curtsy. So one, two, up, one, two, back. One, two, up, one, two, back. Sip, pinky up, sip, pinky up, curtsy. Oh, when the time came, it was the fall of the year, and it was getting quite chilly, getting quite chilly out. So I got prepared to sail away. <clears throat> it was a beautiful sail, but I had memories of that first ship that I came on. There's not a day go by I don't think about the darkness and I cried and I could hear other people crying. I could hear the chain rattling. And it was so dark and cold. But this time it was different. I had my own little room and they would bring food to me and it was very nice. So I thought I would write a poem. Farewell America.
farewell to America. Adieu, adieu, New England's sparling meads. Adieu, the flowing plains. I leave thy opening charms, O spring, and temp the roaring main. In vain for me the flower rise and boast their gaudy pride. While here beneath the northern skies I mourn for help denied. Adieu, <coughs> adieu, America. I like that. And of course it was a beautiful sail when we got to London, England. I think the Countess had my poems published already and perhaps some folks have been reading it. And she probably told everyone that the poetess from Boston, America, would be coming to visit. And while we were riding in the carriage to the cottage, people would wave at me and I would wave at them. And they would say, there she is. <clears throat> There she is, the poet from America. Oh, I felt like a queen. I would wave to people. I said, there she is, the poet is Phyllis Wheatley. Oh, and I would wave to them. It was, it was wonderful. When we got there, the Countess already had a lot of beautiful clothes already laid out for me. But the Countess, of course, sent her apologies because she had to go away on business. But of course, <clears throat> that night we had a ball and the invitation read like a who's who. Anybody who was anybody was there. Dignitaries and royalties. Thomas Gibbons, Granville Sharp, poet and activist Baron George Lyleton. Sir so Brooke Watson, abolitionist and patron, Earl of Dartmouth, and he gave me five guineas. I said, how in the world am I going to get these guineas back to America? But of course he said, I have a cage you can put them in and you'll get them back to America. We'll see to that. Oh, Lord Mayor of London, he gave me my very own copies of Paradise Lost. Before I was borrowing books from the library and there were no books of mine, but this time he gave me my very own copies of Paradise Lost. Oh, I couldn't wait to get back to America so that I can read them. Oh. And then of course, I met Ben Franklin. He was from Philadelphia, the United States. And I met him and shook his hand and he says, oh, I've read your poems and they are delightful. You are truly blessed. You've been blessed by the muse. If ever I can do anything for you, please don't hesitate to call upon me. So that was very nice of him. Oh, and that nice, of course, they brought around tea and I remember what Mary said. I sipped very quietly and I put my pinky up sit very quietly and put my pinky up. And of course, whenever I met royalties and dignitaries, I would curtsy. And then it was time to dance. I counted in my head. One, two, back. One, two, up. One, two, back. One, two, up. Oh, it was delighted. I felt like Cinderella at the ball. And that next night, we had another ball. And different, different dignitaries would come by. And of course, the Countess of Huntington left a beautiful gown for me with silken embroidery in it. Oh, it was the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. And of course, she gave me pearls, genuine pearls. Oh. Oh, and she gave me pearl earrings to match. 
oh, I felt like the fairy at the ball. This was the most beautiful thing I ever owned. So that night when we danced, ah, oh, I felt like an African princess. Oh, we dance and dance and dance. We dance the night away. That was so beautiful. Oh, and of course, I got a, a copy of my book and I read a couple of the poems to the people that were there. And of course, I got standing applause and ovation. And then I could hear them talking. They were talking to John, they says, Phyllis is so, so very brilliant. Why is she such, still a slave in your household? And I didn't know what John's answer was, but I could hear them talking off in the distance. And I just backed away. Then we got some awful news. Mrs. Wheatley was dying near death. So John had to cut his trip short and was sailed back to America. And when we got back to America, Mrs. Wheatley laid in her bed and we all gathered around her. John, her husband Nathaniel, Mary, we all gathered around her bedside and she held my hand. She says, Phyllis, you were like a daughter to me. Oh, but when I go, please do not write a word about me. Please promise me that you'll do that. I didn't want to promise her, but I said yes, because already the words were coming. She said, you must promise me, Phyllis, not one word. Not one word. Shortly thereafter, Mrs. Wheatley died. Oh, I felt so sad. She was indeed like a mother to me. I did write a lot of poems describing how I felt, but I didn't mention her name at all. Shortly thereafter, Mary got married and she moved away. And Mr. Wheatley, of course, was getting sick himself. And things were changing. Boston was changing. The citizens were gathering in groups at night with lanterns and they were chanting, down with taxes, down with taxes. We want our independence and they would run through the streets of Boston at night. <coughs> I could hear them sometimes even with the windows closed. Things were changing. I would often write Obar and says, Obar, how are things in Newport? Because things are changing here in Boston. The citizens are getting restless. So some of the people that lived in Boston they began to move on the outskirts of town because they feared that it would change pretty soon. And luckily, about a week after I came back, a shipment of books came and I had my very own books and I was beginning to sell my books and they were selling very well. People were beginning to buy my books and of course, Mr. Wheatley, of course, would let me go out into the town square and in the grocery store and in the library to sell my books. Oh, I felt good about that. But then, of course, that particular night, John Hancock, he was the leader. He says, tonight, a meeting in the old church. And it says, we're going to throw all the tea and all the molasses into the harbor. And they did just that. And they called it, of course, <coughs> <coughs> the Boston Tea Party. Things were changing and pretty soon they said 
The red coats are coming. They are coming in. And one night, I don't know who came by on his horse and says, the British are coming. The British are coming. Things were indeed changing. We were on the brink of war, a revolutionary war. Oh. <coughs> Two doors down from the Wheatley household, they had already moved to the outskirts of town for the fear that the British soldiers would overtake their houses and make it their quarters, or perhaps make them prisoners. Oh, things were changing, I tell you. Things were changing. And of course, Mr. Wheatley got deathly ill himself and he called us around his bed, me and Nathaniel, because Mary had already gotten married, but Mary came back just to be with her father in his final hours. And he says, all of you have been so wonderful to us. And Phyllis, you've been with us and been so faithful to us. I'm granting you your freedom. You're no longer a slave. You're a free woman, but you can stay here as long as you like. That's if you wanted to. And I, I wish to stay because I had no place else to go. So I told them that I would stay on. And then he says, all right. All the family belongings, the family goods, the family business, the property, the money, all the pictures on the wall, the silverware, the family business, <clears throat> I divided between Mary and Nathaniel. Although he freed me, I wasn't mentioned in the will. He left nothing to me. What am I to do? I don't know how to work. How am I to make a living? If things change and nobody's gonna be buying books now. I was always suspended between two worlds, but now I know to which world I belong. Then Mr. Wheatley died. So now it was just me and Nathaniel in the house and the British soldiers came ashore and they took up occupancy on that house in the corner, three houses down. I knew it would be just a matter of time before they came to Mr. Wheatley's house. What am I to do? And the Boston renter, of course, took its toll on me. <coughs> I was getting weaker by the day. So I would go out to the marketplace and get food and bring it back. And when I went to the marketplace one particular day, I met this gentleman by the name of John Peters. And he said his name was John Peters and he was very astute. And he walked with the cane and he had the white wig like the men in parliament wore. And he said he was a lawyer. He was a realtor. He was a doctor and he was a barber. So of course I told Mama Suki about him, and Mama Suki says, Phyllis, be aware, John Peters is not all he said he's, he is. So be aware, Phyllis, be aware. But I think, <coughs> Mama Suki warning was a little bit too late. Cupid had already struck his arrow. <laughs> so I wrote, of course, to Obar. Obar, I met this gentleman, Obar, and I found him rather complacent. Please let me know what you think. Your friend and humble servant, Phyllis. Oh, and of course, Obar wrote me back about three weeks later and says, complacent, you say? Oh, my dear friend, Phyllis, I think you're in love with John Peters. <laughs> and I was, I was in love with John Peters. So when I would go to the grocery store, he, of course, would escort me back. He says, it's not safe anymore for a beautiful young lady to be out and about all alone. So he would escort me back home and I would take his arm. And he says, 
tomorrow shall I come for tea and I says yes tea would be nice and when he would come we would talk about everything we would walk in the backyard and we would talk about what's happening now and how everything is changing and what's to become of us and what's to become of the the United States and if we had to get into a war what would happen would we get our independence so he says well <clears throat> Whatever happens, of course, we'll be together. And he asked me, will you be my lawful wife? And of course, it was a matter of convenience for me to get married and also to have someone around. So of course, I accepted his proposal and I told Mama Suki about it. And she cooked us a cake and we got married in the backyard and the other servants was there. And it was a beautiful ceremony and we moved into a house not too far from the Wheatleys, a house that was unoccupied. Because I know John Peters knew everybody, and he knew that that particular family moved on the outskirts of town, of fear of what was going to happen. So he said it was his house. So we moved into that house. But of course, shortly thereafter, the, la the, the lamps wasn't working, and the fireplace, they would shut the fireplace off. And they said, when we came back one time from and out and about, the door was closed and we just went in and got our things and moved back to the Wheatley's house. So John Peter says, Phyllis, we've got to move now. We've got to move to the outskirts of town because the British, of course, have occupied the second house. So it's just a matter of time before they get into our house. But before we moved that night, the citizens were taunting the soldiers. They surrounded the soldiers and they were throwing rocks at the soldiers and calling them lobster tails because their red suits were folded at the ends like a lobster tail. And I think they threw rocks at the soldiers so the soldiers of course fired in the crowd and three men lay dead on the streets of Boston. So I went outside as cold as it was <coughs> and I squeezed through the crowd and I tried to see what was going on. Three men lay dead in the streets. One of them was a black man by the name of Crispus Attucks. Mm. They said he was a martyr for the Boston Massacre. This was the beginning of the Revolutionary War. Oh, the beginning of the Revolutionary War. Soldiers had moved in they had blocked the harbor, no one could go in or out. Soldiers had occupied the house on the corner. They were marching through the streets. So John Peters and I packed everything that we could. And of course, we moved on the outskirts of town into a little cabin, a little farm there. And the farmer was there and we asked him, could we stay? And he said, yes, we have a spare bedroom. So we stayed there and they had potatoes, white potatoes in the field. And John Peters would dig the white potatoes. And of course, that's what we ate, the white potatoes. But I'd heard about General George Washington. He and his men were fighting at Valley Forge, General George Washington. So I wrote a letter to him. I was hoping he would get the letter so that maybe he would know that he's not alone, he's not fighting alone, and that he should be brave, and that the citizens are behind him. <coughs> to His Excellency, General George Washington. It is I, poetess Phyllis Wheatley from Boston. I am writing because I heard about the great suffering you and your men have endured at Valley Forge. I too have felt the hardship, although I am here in the house by a warm fireplace. I heard about your brave men how you've endured the cold at Valley Forge. <clears throat> I 
I am hoping that this letter will reach you and give you encouragement to you and your men to fight on for independence. If you are ever near Boston or nearby, please do stop by to visit. Proceed, great chief, with virtue on thy side, thy every action the goddess crowned of golden rise. Where else shall thy be with golden inflated? Washington, be thine. Your humble servant, Phyllis Wheatley. Oh, I do hope that this letter gets to General George Washington. So as time went on, we were indeed in the war. We were fighting the British soldiers for our independence. <coughs> By now I was expecting, I expected my first child. When my first child was born, just a few days after, it was a little boy he died from complications of cold and pneumonia. <coughs> oh, and I too barely survived because I was so weak from my breathing sickness. Uh, and of course, within months, of course, there was a knock on the door and there were soldiers that came in a horse and buggy and they delivered a letter. It was from Miss Phyllis Wheatley from General George Washington. <gasps> he got my letter. I didn't think he would get it. Cambridge, February 28th, 1776. Miss Phyllis, your favor on the 26th of October did not reach my hands till the middle of December. Time enough, you say, to have given you an answer. But a variety of things occurred to impose and distract my mind and withdraw the attention. I do apologize for the delay and plead my excuse for the seeming neglect. <coughs> I thank you for the most sincerely and polite notice of me in your elegant lines. Oh. <clears throat> oh, you have indeed been blessed by the muse. I only meant to give the world this new instance of your genius. I might have incurred the imputation of vanity. Oh, if you shall come to the headquarters or near my headquarters, I shall be happy to see you in person. <clears throat> oh, oh. I am with great respect your humble and obedient serv servant, General George Washington. Oh, <laughs> he got my letter and he answered me. Oh, and about one week later, the soldiers came to take me to his headquarters. Oh, he was taken back a little bit when he saw me because he didn't know really what to think. He never knew that I was a Negro servant at the time, but I'm no longer a servant, I'm free now. Oh. And we discussed my poems and how elegant the lines were and how brave it was and how he enjoyed my poems and it was quite nice to give him encouragement to him and his men. Ah, oh. So he offered me some coffee, but he said, you know, I take that back. These cups will not be fitting someone of your statue. So please forgive me, but at another time I will offer you some coffee in a very, very nice saucer and dish. So I shook his hand and I left his headquarters. I will never forget that. Meeting General George Washington at his headquarters in Cambridge. <clears throat> so I came back 
And by now I was expecting my second child. But in the middle of the night, there was a knock on the door. There were constable from the city of Boston. They said that because we lived in that house on the corner when we first got married in John Peters, saying that he owned the house, he was behind in his taxes and John Peters didn't have any money. So they took him away in debtor's prison. I said, now what, what am I gonna do? I'm expecting my second child and John Peters is gone to debtor's prison and I don't know how to work hard. So what shall I do? So I left us those potatoes and the folks that live in the house that were so kind to me would give me food, bread and milk and potatoes and I would eat that. But they said pretty soon they would have to move because the soldiers are coming along the countryside and they're ravishing all the household and everything in the household and perhaps they would be taken prisoners so they weren't gonna stay. So I said, well, what I'll do, I'll go back to Boston. I remember there was an old house there there was an old, sort of like a boarding house, right between two big houses. No one would know I would be there. It was almost hidden. So I packed everything I could, and then I got in the horse and buggy, and I went back to Boston. And right in the middle between two buildings, there was that, that shelter. Okay, it was there, and nobody would know I would be there. So the soldiers could easily pass by and not know it was there. So I pulled my horse and buggy away in the back and I unhitched them and I went inside and there were a couple of people living in the boarding house. And the lady that was in the boarding house, she says, you can have this room. You don't have to pay me a thing because things are different now. We just want to try to survive and try to help one another. And she helped me to put some wood in the house. But she said, it's very cold outside. I put a lot of logs by the fireplace and I got situated and I found a few things here and there. And it was all, I was almost due. And she says, oh, I'll come and check on you from time to time. Oh, so I said, maybe I'll write something. one on being brought from Africa and I was very weak I barely finished the poem because I was so weak Twas mercy brought me from my pagan land taught my benighted soul to understand that there's a God there's a Savior there's a Savior too once redemption neither sought nor knew. Some view our sable race with scornful eye. Their color is a diabolical dye. Remember, Christian Negroes black as cane may be refined and join the angelic train. I remember the food running low, so I made my way back to the grocery store. I didn't have any money, but I had my pearls. So I gave it to the grocer and I says, this is all I have, it's very valuable. And he says, oh, it looks very valuable. Look, look at the diamond inside the pearl. And he bit it. He said, oh, that's real, all right. Where did you get this? I said, the Countess of Huntington gave it to me when I went to London, England. He said, oh, that's a beauty. So he said, I'll give you two containers of milk, a wad of cheese, and a loaf of bread. He says, oh, thank you, thank you. And I went on, I left it with him. I went on back to the house. And I drank the milk and I ate the bread. 
one slice per day because I wanted it to last just a small bit of cheese. And then my little, my little baby girl was born. Oh. Oh, my little baby girl was born. Oh. <coughs> oh, by now I was so weak. Oh. Oh, and pretty soon the fire got low in the fireplace and I had to burn some of my clothes. I didn't want to burn my clothes, but I had to keep the fire going and I had to put some of my papers in the fireplace to keep the fire burning. All the papers that I could find, I burned them in the fireplace, some of my books. Oh, oh I try to keep my baby warm. As time went on, it got real cold in, in my room, and <sighs> why is my baby so cold? Why is my baby so cold? Phyllis Wheatley lay dead in the boarding house. Her baby died a couple of hours before she did. The unknown little enslaved girl from an unknown village in the Gambia, Africa, buried in an unknown grave in America. Phyllis Wheatley, the literary genius. To this day, no one knows where she is buried. There is the Phyllis Wheatley Poet Society in Boston. In the Boston Square, they've erected a statue in her honor. There have been countless number of books written about her countless numbers of places like college dormitories, schools, societies, public parks, YMCAs, named after her, Phyllis Wheatley. In some colleges, freshmen are required to take Phyllis Wheatley poems 101 and 102. Phyllis Wheatley, the literary giant, the first black woman to publish a book of poems in the United States. Phyllis Wheatley, the literary giant.